Good morning, Dr. Jacob Ham. Uh, Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, you're you're on the farm. Oh, it's a um, it's a place in upstate New York. This corporate retreat center that the psychiatry department took us to one year. And I just took that picture. I thought it was lovely. And who doesn't want to be on a farm these days when we're all stuck in our apartments? So uh, you, you, your story, you're you're talking about training psychiatrists, um, or yeah, could could you talk a little bit? about your background. Obviously, first of all, for, for full disclosure, our relationship is that we're both involved in a program called Fresh Start uh, Recovery Center, which is a, uh, I, I guess you'd, how, how would you describe, what, what's, it, what's it called, what type of a? It's a week-long retreat for people to give them a real foundation in understanding the impact of trauma on their lives, um, to give them a real experience of what it could feel like to be free from it, and to go back into their lives and keep looking for other ways to keep growing. It started by a friend of ours. Uh, I can't pronounce his name the way you do. Yechanan Palter. <laughs> yeah, he started it. And, and, and just so everyone understands, we're both on the advisory board there. I'm, I do sort of the rabbinical stuff. And of course, you, you're there because, well, you were just talking about you know, training psychiatrists. Uh, and just uh, talk a little bit about your... Uh, background, your expertise, especially in trauma? Um, sure. Um, I've been, shoot, I, I trained in the, in the 90s. So I've been doing clinical work for a long time, even though I look like I'm like in my 20s or 30s or whatever. Um, and let's see, the, the first exposure to trauma work was actually in grad school. We had an incredible semester long course on trauma. And um, I found it the most profound course that I'd taken. I had just taken a, we, we did a year long course just memorizing the DSM, which is the diagnostic Bible for, for therapy. We, we memorized every criteria for every disorder. And then we had half a semester of um, trauma work and it was an elective, but the DSM course was a requirement. And like every other medical student, I, although I wasn't in medical school, it's called a medical student syndrome. Every disorder that we covered in the DSM, I went to my therapist crying like, I think I have this. Oh, my God. And he would just laugh the way you are. And then whenever I got to trauma, it was like, oh, I have this for real. And we all do. We, we all can. Because trauma is the only disorder in the DSM that's actually rooted in something really bad happening to you. Everything else pretends like it's like purely biological. And sure, certain diseases like schizophrenia, and bipolar, OCD, they have much more of a biological factor or variable driving it. But there's a lot of stuff like uh, your typical neurotic disorders like anxiety, depression, that has a huge external component. And we were minimizing that component and just playing up the biology part. And that's what felt so pathologizing for me. Um, and then trauma was also the, it was actually, even though it was uh, rooted in env environment, the science behind trauma was profound. They had traced the impact of stress and trauma on the functions of the immune system, the nervous system, the biology, the neurobiology, the uh, epigenetic impact. And epigenetics is this new science that looks at the impact of environmental factors on reprogramming gene expression that can last for generations on out. And so that's and incredible. And in, plain, and in plain English, what you're saying is that my trauma doesn't even have to be something happened to me. It could have happened to my parents or grandparents. Definitely. They def definitely. They've documented that this has profound impacts. Yeah. Especially around the time of the baby's birth or during pregnancy and right after pregnancy stress around that time wires the child to be ready for a life full of stress, low resources, and um, dangerous predators are all around. I, I know that you do a lot of, I mean, you, you work with all, all types of patients from all types of, of backgrounds, but uh, I know you have, would you say you have a disproportionate amount of Jewish clients? <laughs> I mean, bigger than the than the population at large, disproportionately larger. Oh yes, for sure. Than the two and, and a half percent York. of, well, well, being in New York, okay, that's that'll yeah. also uh, 
yeah, skew the the Jewish numbers. But yeah, wait, well, what do you what do you say about like the fact that is there any reality to the idea that uh, that Jewish people are carrying around stuff from this very long history? And I mean, we all joke about it, but tell me, how real do you think that is? It's been documented. There's a there's a professor at Mount Sinai where I work, Rachel Yehuda, who's done research studies to show that the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors have changes in gene expression that impact their capacity to tolerate stress. Um, so, Doctor, I, you know, when you speak about trauma, you mentioned before that it's, 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 it has its root in something that happened. And you mentioned it doesn't necessarily mean it happened to you. It could have happened a generation ago. But... Um, what do you think, you know, when you, when you speak about something happened, so there are certain things that we think of as like, oh, that, if that happened, that would be traumatic. We all agree that something like that, if it happened, that would traumatize a person. What do you think is the biggest misunderstanding as far as a cause of trauma that people don't even, it doesn't even occur to them, oh, oh, that's traumatic? That could, that could traumatize somebody? You're nodding your head. What is it? What do you have in mind? Um... It's the uh, pervasiveness of neglect and the, and the range of neglect that people can experience. That's the most u- ubiquitous. And I think the research is also showing that it has maybe the greatest impact. Like physical abuse, that's, you can ground that. You can, you can say, oh yeah, I remember that my parents used to hurt me physically. And that's their fault. That's on them. But no one remembers the neglect. The only thing that's left in the adult is, I'm a bad kid. I'm really not that lovable. I'm really not worth your time. I don't really matter. And my parents did the best they could. It's weird. It gets distorted. And so a lot of time I'm trying to convince people that they were somehow like neglected or traumatized, even though it's a small T trauma because it happens day to day over and over again. And I try to help them understand what the impact of that can be on on um, their ability to be resilient and survive life's travails. Uh huh. So you're saying when something happens, the person can remember that this happened, and it has, ha- and, and they could understand, they could appreciate how it could have had this cause, th- this this effect on them. But when nothing happened, it's very hard to attribute any causality to it. Nothing happened. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just making it up. They, they weren't that bad. They still provided food. They sent me to school. They bought me gifts. So a, a parent who's sending a child to school, giving them food, giving them clothing, giving them shelter, well, then tell me, what is neglect? It's when you feel distress. Every child that feels distress seeks comfort and proximity to their caregivers. And then it's how the caregiver responds in that moment that matters so much. Does the the parent recognize that this is a bid for comfort? Or do they see it as like, oh no, children don't cry, be tough, which is survival parenting. If you're living under duress, then there's no room for crying. Crying can get you into trouble. In fact, in my own family, there's, an, there's a family member who um, cried when the Chinese were coming down from North Korea and because he didn't want to brush his teeth. And when, um, because he cried, the soldiers found him and they abducted the, the brother that was trying to protect him. They, they lost him to that. So it's, it really is life or death. You do, not, you do not have time to cry in battle. Wow, wow, and 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 a, and a, and you're telling me that that mentality that was life or death in that terrible situation. It sounds like what you're implying is that they a person doesn't just turn off that mentality when they're in a place where they can't. You can't. You say you can't just turn it off. It's nearly impossible. Why would your body let you stop doing the thing that saved your life? And it's ingrained in you at such a formative time in your life. 
So how do you free people from it? One, you honor that that was necessary to survive that time. And then you start to do this weird thing. I call it, um, you activate presence. I always say that the opposite of trauma is presence. And what I mean by that is that um, what trauma does is that it makes us compartmentalize ourselves. Like in the shamanic tradition, they talk about how like whenever there's a trauma, then you tuck away and hide parts of your soul for safekeeping so that it doesn't get injured by the trauma. And so a lot of the work in shamanic healing is actually to go and retrieve those parts of yourself that you buried away. And I feel like I'm doing that constantly with people. I'm retrieving all the parts of themselves that weren't allowed to be integrated, making them whole. And the way you do that is by creating vibrancy and poignancy moment to moment. You're saying it's self-protective. If I think I'm protecting myself, well, why would I stop? <laughs> How do you get me to stop? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. If I think this is keeping me safe, or you were talking about examples before that are literally life and death, and I think I'm literally preserving my... I'm trying to stay alive over here. So why would I stop doing that? How can I stop doing that? The, that's the art of it. You have to be very, very respectful of that part and say, that was important in this constraint, in these rules, when survival is of utmost importance and the other person was dangerous. But stop for a minute and look in front of you. Who are you in front of right now? Is this person going to hurt you? Is this person trying to meet your needs? It's different rules. Be fully present now. How, how much of it then, uh, it, how much of the effects of trauma are an experiencing present day interactions um, as not what they are basically uh, tell you, you you speak about trauma as the opposite you speak about the opposite of trauma as being present T tell me in very you know day-to-day -day grounded everyday terms what does that look like you know for instance in a relationship where i'm not reacting to you i'm looking at you but i'm reacting to something 10 years old or 50 years old or, or even something that happened in, not in my lifetime but affected yeah t w w describe that experience for me you'll I'll be working with a, a family constellation of some sort parent child couples or whatever they're talking about something very mundane and ordinary and all of a sudden it gets more heated emotionally there's either intensity of emotion or a uh, a, a dissociation from it. It becomes intellectualized. They start debating points. Like they start lawyering, I call it, where they're just debating like the truth of certain words. And or I myself, I myself will either get irritated or bored by the conversation. And then I know that something's <laughs> happening. When you get bored, that's a sign that something's happening. Yes. Because my... My intention, what I love is whenever I'm like pulsing with the other person, whenever I'm feeling their story like a great movie, you know, like a great drama, whether it's joyful or sad, when you're in it, it's like a roller coaster of emotion. Then, then that's, that's real presence. It's these waves of like experience over and over again. But then whenever it's not happening, I get very bored very quickly. And then, and then we have to figure out why, who just entered the room? Like, whose parents just entered the room? What hurt just entered the room that's taken over? Wait, so you're sitting in a room with, with, a, with, with a family, and all of a sudden, things get out of nowhere, out of the blue, so to speak, either really heated or really cold, and in, in which case, you're going to get bored, and you're going to be like, hey, what's up here? Why, why am I feeling bored? Like, something, something, something hap something's happening here that's not real. It's not authentic. And, 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 and what you're saying is you, you, you attribute that to someone entered the room. Like, you don't mean physically entered. I just want to make sure everyone understands 
what you mean. Yeah. D- describe that for me. What, 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 describe that. Uh, in the more classical terms, uh, someone's gone into a reenactment. Uh, in the trauma terms, I've heard someone say that um, they're having an emotional flashback. In couples terms, someone's called them demon dialogues. So Is there's all these different la- words to use to describe these reenactments, re-experiencing situations, where for some reason a person's anger triggers in the other person uh, memories, visceral memories of a parent yelling and screaming at them. And it's not conscious. It's visceral. Visceral meaning Sometimes it can be conscious, but as stress escalates, self-awareness drops in direct proportion. So it's not like someone says, you're, you're, you're treating me just like my mother treated me. They're not saying that. They're just saying, F off. And then, and then you're like, why are you saying that all of a sudden? Because they don't, do? they don't respect me. And like, in what point did respect come into this conversation? Why is it about that all of a sudden? Why are you experiencing uh, so it in, in that filter? You're saying it, it's oftentimes very incongruous, like, like out of the blue. Like, how did that come up? Yeah. When there's such a mismatch between the intention of the speaker and the way that the speech was received. But you know what I'm thinking? That's happening in the room in a therapeutic setting, what you're describing. What if that's happening? A husband and wife are sitting at the dinner table and you're not there to referee, and one person is reacting to another person who's not even in that room and is totally unaware that the, the, the communication they're having is not even to each other. All the time. I'd say like 70% of our interactions are not with the person directly in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So, so what do we do? What do we do? I mean, I, I, would, I would assume then I'm making an assumption here, but the goal is, I mean, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I guess a goal would be to learn how to respond to the person that's in front of me. That's one goal. That's the ideal goal for sure. And the way to get there is that um, you can't banish all these demons or ghosts in your past you just have to line them up next to you because they're acutely attuned to pick up on the thing that they're they were crafted to pick up on right but they shouldn't be the ones in control of the conversation they can advise you but they can't be in control so they're acutely attuned like they're experts at detecting certain yeah so if I was exposed to a certain kind of trauma, I'm probably really good at sniffing that out yes. and identifying it yes. way before it's in my face. Yes. Right. So if you're doing anything that's even remotely similar to something that I, my, my little internal trauma expert is an expert in, I'm going to think you're about to do it even if you're a, a, a thousand miles removed from actually posing that threat. Yeah, before we're even aware of it, that little person will know about it. Mm-hmm. And so you want me to become aware of it and say, okay, that's an advisor, you know, like sitting on the shoulder and saying, hey, heads up, um, this might resemble a, an experience which has, which has been traumatic in the past. And then I should be able to tell my advisor, it's cool. It's just Jacob Ham. He's not going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you should think like, huh, let me think about it for a second. Okay, I thought about it. It's just Jacob Ham. No, no big deal. And he's not going to kill me. <laughs> yeah. But thank you, for, thank you for keeping your guard up. You thank the voice for keeping your... Wow. Yeah. You have to. But, but, but that internal voice... Let's say I come to you for... To, because trauma, look, nobody came to you because life is going well. If they come to you, it's because they're having problems. If, and then I find out my problem is trauma. Why wouldn't I be so angry at that voice that's ruining my life? That's the enemy. And you, you want me to think that voice? Yeah. 
God, I only have a picture in my mind. When I'm doing this work of coming to understand these parts of ourselves that are so hostile to us, right? Be- I keep having this image of like um, someone just opened a door a crack and they're like, get away from here. We don't want anything you have to offer us. And they want to slam the door on your face. And then if you look past them, then you often see this small child huddled in a fetal position on a couch. And that part is trying to protect them. Wow. Wow. So <laughs> that, that's, very, that's a very complex uh, metaphor and visualization. But basically, you're saying, I'm experiencing this voice it, that's, that's very harsh, very brash, because its job is survival. So I, would, I, I understand if its job is survival, it's going to be very harsh and brash. But it's not a bad guy. Yeah. They're and just trying to protect trying to you from being hurt life. again. He's, tr- he's trying to save me from getting hurt again. But he's, yeah. but, he, but he's not doing a good job because he's making me get hurt again. Because if I'm in a conversation with you, but I yeah. feel like on a visceral level, I'm in a conversation that's, yeah. you know, 50 years ago. So he's not letting me live. He thinks Correct. he's helping me live. He's not, he, he's, he's not letting me live. You have to do two things. One is that um, you have to you have to start comforting that injured child behind the that voice. If you don't protect that child, then that that need to protect will never go away. And then once you start to comfort and heal that injured child, then you can say, "Look, listen, you were good back then, but I learned a few things since you were born." And I know who this guy is in front of me. I can handle this. You're not in control anymore. But you have to, you have to start comforting and healing and hugging that little child first. Otherwise, the need to protect that child never goes away. Can you talk about, I, I know we don't have a, a, a great deal of time here, and we'll have to you know, have a follow-up. I would love to have a continuation of our discussion, but talk a little bit about what that looks like in an actual therapeutic setting when a person becomes aware. Let's say they're at the point where, where they become aware of what that survival mechanism is, how it served them and how it's not serving them. W- what do I do now? I talk to it. I, I tell me, what do I do? Okay, I know it's there. I know it's there and I know what it is. What do I do? This is where it becomes incredibly delicate. And this is where I often want to tell people to shut up and stop thinking so much. The way it looks is that, um, one, they're incredibly activated. And so it's hard to even engage them. So I have to like get them back into the moment because they're reliving their traumas. And then we have to say, like, instead of having a clear plan, let's just like turn our gaze to that part. Let's attend to it with tenderness and wait for it to tell us what it needs. And, or like wait to see what it says or what it gives you in terms of a memory. And so you're changing this. The what do I do about this is this um, active problem-solving energy that's wrong for healing. It's actually more of a, like a sitting back and receiving energy. And it's different for each person how to get them into that. And then when people get into that, it's terrifying. It, they feel vulnerable, out of control, because their self-protective guard dogs aren't around them. The people who are amazing at it, they stop for a few minutes and they close their eyes and they look inward. And then like a memory will show up of a little boy who was neglected or something like that, or left behind a closet or in the, in the bathtub, hiding from the father who was raging and drunk. And then when they reach that part, then like a flood of emotions comes out. They start reliving the terror of that moment, but they also start um, experiencing grief and loss that their childhood was filled with that and that their life has been devastated by it. And that's when the healing starts. What are these voices... um 
say that they need when 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 we're quiet and we don't try to serve them we just try they to don't know they never know you have to be the grown up in this moment it's when it's like the toddler that's just like crying on the floor you have to swoop it up so there's a voice inside of me that with this great urgency that you know this is life or death this is life or death this is life or death and finally when we're just quiet we say okay Sweetie, what do you need? And he doesn't even know. You start with the hug. It's like with my three-year-old. Like whenever he's crying, um, the the classic response from survival parenting is like, no, no, no. Inside voice, gentle tone, like say it properly. Like his Lego just broke, right? And he's like screaming bloody murder, murder that the Lego pieces fell apart. And most people's response is to regulate the expression of that emotion. But from my training as a psychologist, I know like a three-year-old is all limbic energy, no capacity for self-regulation or like limited capacity for self-regulation. And that what he needs is for me to be the regulator. And so I, I come in and I say, oh no, what happened? Oh no. And I try to give him soothing energy in my voice, my intonation, my cadence, maybe touch if he allows it. You have to be careful about that. And then he tries to put it into words. It broke. I say, oh no, it broke. And so me knowing him in his pain starts to bring him back down. Okay, you're describing the, you know, good parenting of a toddler. But you're, you're using that as a metaphor because now let's, let's talk about healing from trauma. There's no actual toddler. I'm the toddler. I'm the adult and I'm the toddler. So what, what does that mean do you ever talk to yourself like that? When you make a mistake, when you're in your depression, so-called depression, when you're like saying this will never get better, or whenever you, you're hurt, typically we're, we say like suck it up, stop whining about it or whatever. We treat ourselves horribly. It should be more like, why did that hurt so much? What's going on? You make space for that pain. Is, is, that a, is that a skill that can be taught? Yes. It can't, doesn't, it's not taught intellectually, though, or mecha mechanistically. You have to live it. You have to Not drill a checklist. It. It's not like a, a behavioral checklist. Do this, do this, do this. It's hard. It's hard for people to do that. Because whenever you're activated, then the child takes over or the inner critic takes over. The part of you that could follow a checklist <laughs> disappears. <laughs> Even if you had the checklist, it wouldn't help. Okay. So then what, what do sometimes you Sometimes it people? can. Hmm? Some, sometimes it can, but it's really hard. Like um, I, I talk about whenever um, I'm working with schools and I want them to create like a, uh, you know how they used to have timeout spaces in, in school to punish kids who are acting out and to deprive them of any positive reinforcements? Nowadays, in a more trauma-informed approach, they use a, a calm space, a chill out space where they put like soothing pillows or like manipulatives or any kind of sensory toys in there that are that provide comfort and regulatory input. And then what I would suggest that people add is a letter that a child writes to themselves whenever they're upset or a letter from their mom or something like that whenever they're upset. Hey, Johnny, you're I know you're having a tough time, but I love you nonetheless and I know how much you love school. And once we figure out why you're upset, you can get back to playing and, and enjoying school again. Something comforting to ingrain that self into the head too. I, I know that you, your, your expertise is in trauma. And um, you know, as, as, as we've mentioned, trauma is caused by something, it has a cause. But I, I'm just curious, to what extent do you feel like what you're describing, you know, like harsh inner critic, that kind of, you know, the negative voice, um, that fight or flight that's just unnecessary. That sounds like a lot of us. That sounds like maybe all of us. To what extent do you think this stuff is kind of universal and not just specific to those who have had trauma in the most conventional sense? 
there's something about that question that I find so bad. And, but not, I'm, I'm not criticizing you, but I'm criticizing the world because we want to other people with disease or suffering. We want to say, like, that's not me. I'm not traumatized. Whereas I would say that um, we can all be traumatized. This, what I'm describing, is all too human. But it's the severity of it, the stuckness of it, that really um, distinguishes someone who can live their life with, despite their inner critics or someone who is incapacit- incapacitated by it. Okay, so let me, let me, you know, language is important. Let me rephrase that. Instead of talking about trauma victims and non-trauma victims, let's just assume that trauma is universal and that what varies from person to person is the degree. So those of us who believe at least that we've had a minor degree of trauma, and maybe we really have had a very minor degree. What do we need to know for ourselves? What does the knowledge of, of, of trauma help a person who says, and even rightfully says, I never had a, a severe degree of trauma? I'll give you the quick answer first. The questions that I would ask, the questions that I would want that person to ask themselves is, do you live by your aspirations and your goals? Do you live led by your by the desire for love and by your virtues? Or are you um, living in like a risk avoidant fear based way of thinking? And the longer answer is that, um, see, if we focus on trauma, then it's the wrong thing. What we should be focusing on is um, the way that the brain works and that there's this limbic part of us that's driven by fear and survival and basic stuff like f- food and f- um, the four F's that we learned in school and sleep and all this biological stuff. And then there's this higher self that's l- located in the prefrontal cortex. And those two are always battling with each other because the survival part of the brain always has precedence It has carte blanche authority to take over. And then the prefrontal part is incredibly difficult to maintain. It takes a lot of maturation. It's the last part of the brain to develop in the the early 20s for women and in the mid-20s for men. It's the first thing that gets injured. It's the uh, first thing that gets depleted with the lack of sleep or food. um, Some people have argued that it's actually like a peacock's tail, that it's a display of... um, good parenting and good resources whenever you have a great prefrontal cortex. So those two parts of us are always warring. And um, what trauma does is that it's like an incredibly profound driver of who wins that battle. And they've done imaging studies to show that trauma has these enormous impacts on enlarging the amygdala, on like increasing blood flow to that part of the brain, to decreasing blood flow and making parts of the prefrontal cortex atrophy. It's a trump card in terms of who wins that battle. But that's a battle that we all struggle with. Wow. So basically, this is the human condition. Yes. And the degree of trauma basically is the degree to which that universal struggle has been amplified. Yeah. Any final message for now as far as what you would want? Someone who's listening to this, uh, obviously they're watching this, something piqued their curiosity. Maybe it's because they heard of trauma. Maybe they think maybe they have trauma. What do you want somebody to do now after they're finished watching this? Wow, that is an exciting moment when they're on the precipice of change. Keep looking, keep searching. There's no one answer. Don't land on one answer. Keep growing, keep trying new things. I constantly am learning new things and trying new things. And then share what you've learned with other people. I want to thank you for sharing what you've learned 
with us. And uh, there's a lot of food for thought here and a lot of interesting ways of, of looking at this subject that, that you've given us. Uh, I have to... Let's do it again. I, I feel like I want to take a walk now and just sort of unpack everything you've yes. told me. Mission accomplished then. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. I really... I thank you. I thank you for talking about this, this subject. And I'm, and I'm sure I'm sure that it will... Um, at least one person will, will find that it's directly helpful in their next next phase, next step in life. That is all I ask for. Let this be of use for one person and then it'll be worth our time. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, we got to do it again. Thank you. Definitely. Okay. All okay. right. Be well. You too. Bye-bye.